Alan Hirsch Advisors, creating aha moments, presents Aha Business Podcasts. We provide opportunities to discover information to help you run your business and guide your decision making. The more you know, the better decisions you make. For more information, log on to alanhirschadvisors.com. I'm your host, Alan Hirsch. Attention business owners, has your business suffered financially from COVID-19? If so, let us help. I am Alan Hirsch, a member of Business Coaches Assembled under a grant from the Small Business Breakthrough Executive Team. Our mission is to help business owners who have seen their revenues negatively impacted by 20% or more due to the virus. We can help you recover 50,000 to 70,000 or more of your lost revenue over the next 90 to 120 days. For more information, go to www.ahaonlinelearning.com to receive my book, 45 Minute Breakthroughs. That's go to www.ahaonlinelearning.com. Welcome to today's podcast. My guest today is Doug Went of Went Partners. Uh, thank you for being here, Doug. I appreciate it. Always a pleasure. Alan. Thank you, sir. It's an honor my to be pleasure. Here. So what motivates you to get up in the morning and go to work? Oh, that's a great question. Honestly, uh, the most important of my day every day right now is our morning stand up in the company. And that's a 20 minute, maybe 30 minute meeting where we actually we do stretches, we do a cheer, we share funny stories. That half an hour is honestly one of the most motivating reasons I get up in the morning. I love that part of the day. And I know how critical that part of the day is for my team and for myself. Mm -hmm. So how did you get started in this, uh, uh, in Went Partners? Oh, wow, that's a great question. So, you know, just to set the stage, uh, I say that we're in version 3.0 of our company. So today we are a consulting firm that t t connects the dots between, you know, business strategy, brand strategy, CRM, sales and marketing, all the five of the elements involved in growing a company. We started 14 years ago as more of a traditional communications firm. Um, and actually, it was originally an idea that my late wife, Alice, had uh, that she wrote down on the back of a napkin, literally on the back of a napkin during our drive back from vacation one summer uh, in North Carolina. And she said, you know, you should really think about doing this. So it was originally supposed to be, you should think about doing this. And I said, okay. And then I started doing it. And then I turned to her and said, you should really think about joining me in the doing of this. And the rest is history. So, okay. So tell me a little bit about, you know, what you do, your strategies, you, you work on uh, uh, strategy, you work with CRMs. Uh, so tell us a little bit about how you bring about your customers into what you're doing. Sure, that's a great question. And it partly has to do with the evolution of our own company. So when we started the firm 14 years ago, as I said, we were a traditional communications firm. And what we realized very quickly is that clients had a desire to communicate, but not a clear picture of what to communicate. So we started really focusing on strategy, not just communication strategy, but just strategy, period. What is our message? Why? What markets do we want to serve? How do we differentiate? Where are we trying to take the business or organization? So the needs of our clients led us into the strategy arena. And then the other components came together because as we started executing communication programs with a focus on marketing and public relations, we quickly realized that we weren't really connecting the dots across the process. So if the process of generating revenue involves everything from generating demand or interest, right? What, what business people would usually refer to as generating leads all the way through to closing a deal. We need to have some ability to impact that process. The reason historically, I think this hasn't happened is twofold. Number one's culture. Sales culture is very different than marketing culture. The kinds of people who go into these fields tend to be different. Traditionally, marketers are writers. Salespeople are talkers. Traditionally, marketing people are thinking of maybe the next quarter or the plans for the year. The salesperson is thinking of the next month or possibly the quarter. So they have different cultures, different time horizons. The second reason why these worlds have been separate is technology. 
until maybe five, seven years ago at, at the very earliest, more, for most companies, this transition is still happening. And that is prior to that, sales, marketing, CRM, these were all separate technologies. So a company might have marketing automation if it's a very large enterprise, uh, but that wouldn't really connect with the CRM system. You know, I started my career on Act 2.3, I think it was, which was one of the last DOS versions before it went to Windows. Nobody would have ever thought about what the future held in terms of digital marketing. And then when digital marketing developed in the 90s and 2000s, it developed really as a separate universe, completely disconnected from sales and CRM. Now we're at a point where with cloud technology, we can finally connect these dots. So the two issues that have held all these pieces separate from one another, one is culture and background and focus and the other is technology. Now we can start to close those gaps because today a good salesperson is a good writer and a good marketer understands the sales cycle. So they need to come together if we're gonna to continue to see revenue growth. So responding to that, we've become a hybrid company that connects those dots for our clients and for ourselves. Yeah. So how do you go about uh, with, and, and one of the things I see is still a divergence in many companies, even startups or young companies that right. still separate marketing from sales. Right. They, they, don't, they don't mesh. They don't get together and have a similar system. So how do you get them to become one system? That's a spectacular question, because you're right. Even brand new companies today are largely still following that model. So well, let me just interrupt here. They're still yeah. teaching that old model. Yes. In our, in our business school, <laughs> they're teaching the models of large businesses that build on brand, which can yes. send millions of dollars on TV and radio. And that's not the model anymore. Absolutely correct. Yes. You're right. The, if, if I went to an MBA program today, uh, marketing would still be a department and sales would barely be discussed and CRM would be buried inside some courses in technology, you right. know, technology for non-technologists, <laughs> right? And that would right. be it. Right. Yes. And, and you're absolutely correct. And there'd be a fight within the faculty about whether brand belongs in the marketing you know, <laughs> department or in the strategy department within the School of Business. So you're correct the, the we've got a long ways to go, but there are some important ways that we've started to solve for this. First of all, there is a distinction on some level between what we'll call marketing and what we'll call sales, but not nearly as much as there used to be. The distinction that I like to use is, is try to be as simple as possible. Marketing in most companies, particularly in business to business and smaller companies, marketing is about one-to-many communication Sales is about one-to-one -one communication. The reason I like that phrasing is it takes away the cultural assumptions about what marketing does and what sales does. So that's part of it is redefining terms. Another part of it is working to, if you have separate departments in a company and for structural or operational reasons, that's not something that's going to change, then it's important to create what we call a service level agreement. Another term we took from the tech industry, right? So the so what idea is service of a letter, what's a service, service letter, service agreement? level agreement, sorry, right, an SLA. So when a company signs a contract, let's say with Amazon Web Services to host their SaaS application, right? So let's say um, Slack, okay, or, you know, Google Apps. So any of those applications that we use in the cloud, when that company signs a contract for hosting it with Amazon, Amazon writes a service level agreement, says we guarantee X percent uptime, here are the technical factors involved, it's all of that kind of information. Okay. We're taking that terminology and applying it to sales and marketing, and what we do is we define what marketing's role is and what sales' role is in the overall process of growth, okay? The other thing that we've started to do is actually create a third discipline, which, uh, which is a hybrid role. So one of the challenges is there's actually a lot of benefit in applying sales techniques to communication that is not necessarily focused on an immediate deal. So let me describe a scenario. The company may have a lot of high priority 
excellent fit prospects that have not expressed interest in purchasing. And so they're not currently considered leads by the sales department. There's no identified sales opportunity. So a salesperson who's held to a quota and is primarily compensated on commission is not going to work that contact. Okay. However, we, if we're doing webinars and events and we're publishing eBooks and we are creating content, there is significant strategic advantage in someone reaching out one-to-one -to, -one to that person to say, hi, I'm Frank from XYZ Company. I, I wanted to make sure that you saw our new healthcare ebook. I know that you're working on transformation with an Anne Arundel Regional Healthcare System, and I thought this might be of interest to you. That is a sales style action because it's one-to-one, -one, but you could almost call it a marketing function because it's not focused on the immediacy of closing a deal, right? There's no, not even a lead there. So we're actually creating a new function called outreach coordinator, okay, who is focused on providing non-sales cycle oriented one-to-one -one communication. So that person is not on a quota. Okay, they're responsible for providing what I call high quality courtesy communication. And the idea is that between marketing's one to many, sales is one to one where there's a sales cycle and this intermediate role that connects the dots, you generate a very high level so, so, of engagement. So how long do you keep someone engaged in this in that in the uh, uh, outreach uh, department? In, or so right. some people call them drip campaigns. Yes, yes. My only challenge, uh, my my challenge with the term drip campaign is it usually implies just a series of automated emails. Then there's a place for that. And that's not the only definition of drip campaign, but it's the most common one. And we're specifically talking about email and phone and potentially LinkedIn all one-to-one, -one, legitimately one-to-one. -one. So that's a role that a lot of companies actually, some of our clients have it on a part-time basis, in which case some of them actually contracted to us and others have it on a full-time basis. And we've actually trained them and set up the systems and processes and expectations for that position. So it's really not so much a matter of how long do we keep the drip going? It is how, what is our cadence of marketing activity that ties to that individual. So in the example I sort of made up on the fly, I was implying that we've created an ebook that's specific to healthcare technology. So I'm not gonna to communicate to all of my high priority contacts. I'm just gonna prior, uh, you know, communicate about that in this one-to-one -one nature, specifically to my healthcare high priority contacts. You know, it's like, I like to say, it's like treating uh, a high priority contact as if they are already a customer, even though they're not, okay? And by doing that, you can generate a significant amount of increased engagement. For example, we held a webinar last October and one of the people who registered for that webinar never actually came to the webinar, okay? He had previously been, he'd received uh, outreach from both our outreach person and also from our inside sales department. So we had attempted to set an appointment and start a sales cycle. He'd, re he'd gotten marketing communications, most of which he hadn't done anything other than click on. So by all accounts, this is a very low level, you know, likelihood of engagement, right? Like we're not seeing evidence this person's ready to buy from us. And yet two weeks after that webinar, Okay, with no prior communication from me and no prior relationship, he reached out to me one to one with an email asking me to set up time in the next week or so for he and I to talk about how Went Partners could serve his company. And so when I spoke with him, I said, you know, this is the this is literally what we all dream of is having a perfectly qualified prospect begging me for time for me to sell them. And I said, what's the story behind that? And he said, I, you know, I had heard from somebody from your company. I just let it slide out of my mind, but the, I got a follow-up email that was well-written. I made note of that, but then I didn't think about it any further. I saw your webinar invites. You're doing things. I got the impression you guys are in motion. And I was just in a strategic management meeting with my executive team one day. And one of the issues you guys clearly addressed popped up. And I said, I think I know who we need to talk to about that. And that's how we started that conversation. Well, one of the things that I look at, uh, which most people don't look at, is you know it takes seven to twelve average connections to reach someone who's ready to buy something. 
Yes. Only one to three yes. percent that are ready to buy now. That's and most, so. And most companies, they reach out to somebody in a generic email. Right. And, and they never they never reach out again. Right. And they never follow through. And it it's it's you know you need to find a uh, uh, in my language a squeeze page. Right. To attract right. them to get that publication. Yes. Uh, ebook, which is I do. I have a 45 right. minute breakthroughs. Yes. Which, which I use as an ebook. They go online. Uh, they, we get them a drip campaign uh, until they uh, unsubscribe to the to the campaign. <laughs> or they or they reach out and make an appointment with me. But no. your first email in that campaign was so riveting that I think I downloaded it right after the first message. I didn't need any of the others. <laughs> I was already there. <laughs> uh, but but uh, and it, it's it's an email that basically says we appreciate your interest. We're not going to reach out to you personally because you're not ready. When you're ready, you'll reach out to us. Right. And right. And that's the and it, it's it's working. Uh, uh, yes. And the 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 other things are, are are creating the kinds of messages that are dynamic, and that's marketing and sales combined. Yes, absolutely. You know, and I'm going to key into something that you just mentioned or, I, or alluded I, I wanna, to. Oh, uh, no, I go ahead, to, Alan. I'm to, sorry. That's okay. Continue. I, I need to go to the break right now. Oh, all so we'll right. We're going to take we'll, a break, folks. We'll take a break for, for the uh, commercials. And then when we come back, I'm going to continue this conversation with Doug Went of Went Partners. I'm Alan Hirsch of Alan Hirsch Advisors, and this is AHA Business Podcast. Hi, Rick Dempsey here. As a former Oriole and Series MVP, I know a lot about winning and championship teams. Today, I'm happy to tell you about my award-winning web design and internet marketing team, Adventure Web Interactive. For over two decades, many of Maryland's most successful firms have chosen Adventure Web as their strategic partner for web design and online marketing. I can tell you from using them personally, their search engine optimization and social media programs have saved their clients tens of thousands over the traditional pay-per-click digital agency. Visit AdventureWebInteractive.com and listen to what clients such as Hercules Fence, TriStar Electric, ABC Rental, Rhine Landscaping, Markdown's Office Furniture, and many more highly successful firms have to say. And don't forget to tell them Rick Dempsey sent you. Strengthen, protect, and preserve your retirement nest egg. Scott Garceau here for the Stephen J. Sless Group, Baltimore's reverse mortgage specialist. Reverse mortgages have evolved to become a viable retirement tool. Enjoy retirement without monthly mortgage payments, improve cash flow, pay off debt, and stretch retirement savings. Stephen and his team can offer strategies to make housing wealth work for you. If you're 62 or older, learn if a reverse mortgage could help. Visit reversebaltimore.com. An equal housing opportunity lender. This is not a commitment to last Stephen J. Sless, NMLS 298581. PRMI, NMLS 3094. We're back. Welcome back to the podcast. Uh, I'm uh, Alan Hirsch of Alan Hirsch Advisors, and I have with me Doug Went of Went Partners. And we've been talking about, uh, uh, I call them drip campaigns, you call them outworks coordination. And, <laughs> and uh, uh, so, you know, you were about to say something in response to my little diatribe on, on having my own drip campaign. So nope. go ahead. Not a diatribe, a success story. So you brought up something very interesting. One of the, probably the number one most requested service that we have not historically offered, the clients have asked for, is basically to outsource a, a sales development rep role, a cold caller, uh, right? And there are a couple of reasons that why we've never done that. But the number one reason isn't because we don't think it works, by the way, because we actually have an inside sales department of two people on our own team who make calls, send emails, try to engage in conversations, answer questions, and handle both inbound and outbound lead generation uh, with a personal touch. The reason why we've hesitated is because of that tendency to think that sales and marketing are unrelated activities. So a company says, I, I redid my website, right? At least it looks okay. So now let's go, you know, do an outreach campaign or, or excuse me, do a, a, a set up a, an outbound sales effort. 
Well, what we insist upon is that clients build a content marketing program with drip campaigns and all the elements that you're talking about, Alan. And then there's a certain point where then they're ready to engage in direct outreach as well. There's that tendency to assume that you don't need both. I'll just do one, not the other. And that's where people have, you know, there's the big whole debate about what does it take to get the job done? You talk about seven to 12 impressions. The best way to make those impressions is mixed media. So I receive maybe a voicemail message, a very courteous, non-pushy one. Uh, you know, I get a personal email. And then later on, maybe I receive an ad on LinkedIn, you know, a couple of days later, maybe two weeks later, I'm invited to a webinar that's relevant to my industry. You're trying to build an overall impression of credibility, of sophistication, that you can add value to your customer. That's how you make them want to be a customer. And, so and we, the two we, work together. Yeah, and we put this, uh, we look at doing it as an educational opportunity and we actually put in videos yes. on each, on each uh, uh, drip, drip message so that they can look at a video and help them change what they're doing as, as we do it uh, in coaching. So they can come Absolutely. to us and get the rest of it. So it, it's, it's a matter of the, the as, as we look at it, it's the market, the message and the media. And yes, you, market you, message medium. I love that. Right yeah. on. And you've got to look at all three. Yes. And the message is probably the most important. Yes. Now, if I were to go back to your startup scenario, if I were to build a company from scratch, I would actually appoint a chief growth officer, a person who's responsible for all aspects of the revenue cycle, not just sales, not just marketing. Okay. And then I wouldn't have CRM stuck over in an IT department. <laughs> Anything involved in generating and maintaining that customer relationship needs to be under one person, chief growth officer. And if we continue to create any sort of functional distinctions, um, I think it's okay to have people who just do marketing activity, but they should be part of the growth department. They shouldn't be siloed in a separate department. This is one group of people that need to be listening to other, each other and they need to be understanding each other. Simple litmus test if your marketing team is adding value to your company the right way. Can your marketers write the email templates and the sales call scripts that your salespeople know and want and believe in? If the answer is no, the disconnect is so large, it, one wonders if your marketing is accomplishing anything. Right. Because you're trying to create content that will generate the same sales opportunity your salespeople are trying to close. That's got to be one message, right? Absolutely. It's got to be one message. Uh, and uh, I mean, one of the things we do is help people find that message. Yes. And it's a market that we call it a market dominating message or compelling offer. Yes. That compels someone to inquire. That is right. Exactly. Yes. And so it's got to be consistent, not only through different channels, but, but through different stages of the relationship development effort. Correct. Yes. Like in our own team, because we have we have our own content and inbound writers, you know, because we offer those services. Uh, but our team goes through cross training. Everybody who writes content writes both marketing and sales content. And by the way, they also learn the CRM technology that we implement. So they know exactly how the technology is going to use what they write. So we want them to be well-rounded so they can actually get the job done for the client across the different approaches and aspects of the growth cycle. Yeah. So what, what do you do, you know, when it, when it comes to getting your clients to come to grips with this growth officer? Mm. Because they're, it's, it's so ingrained to keep them separate. Yes. Yes. So that's, that's a great question. Part of it has to do with how we present ourselves to the market. So we tell clients that uh, the senior strategist on our team will serve as your outsourced fractional chief growth officer. So part of it is the language you use right up front. We also talk from day one about the growth stack, which is our phrase for the five components I've described, business strategy, brand strategy, CRM, sales, and marketing. Even if a client ends up having us focus primarily in one area or in the other, you know, we have some clients 
for whom their initial engagement is really focused on sales process, sales technology, maybe sales coaching. We have other clients for whom really day one is we don't even have a database of the customers other than what's in QuickBooks, which is mostly billing contacts. Like we don't have an organized picture of our, of our customers, our market. So there's a research part. There are a lot of different points that we start at, but regardless, the process we go through always looks at all five of those and at least sets some key markers for an action plan. So, uh, so that's key. We usually, most of our clients are, are retainer relationships. They're long-term partnerships. They usually uh, start with that first month really being a deep dive across the five components. So even if there are existing silos or cultural issues, we're working to break those down from day one. It's gotta be one of the reasons that the CEO selects us. Um, they may not have all the answers, but they've gotta believe that this integrated model is the right way to go for their company. Yeah, so I mean, small, mid-sized businesses, you know, the million to 10 million range. Yes. Uh, it's the CEO that sometimes has this responsibility and has no idea what to do with it. Yes, yes. So and, how do you deal and, with that? Well, that's so it's funny that you talked about that because the other strange thing in that market segment, which is one of the two that we serve every day. So we focus on that one to 10, and then we have a separate, slightly different model for our 10 to let's say 25 or 30 million companies, right? Um, but the bottom line is um, the challenge that we're trying to overcome from day one is in those smaller companies, often this bizarre gap in which the owner or CEO is the chief sales officer and the marketing has been delegated to someone with a couple years at most experience who's like a marketing assistant. And so you have no real strategic infrastructure in the middle, right? Because the sales model that the CEO uses may have some value obviously to inform what we wanna do, but that can't be replicated. I, I mean, I know this, I have to remind myself, I cannot ask, other people to be me, okay? What I can do is take some of what I do and try to package it and make it part of what other people can do. But your AEs, your account executives, anyone else who sells for you cannot sell exactly the same way as the CEO because everybody you sell to knows it's your baby. You're the owner. It's got your name on the door. That's something nobody else can replicate. So the first thing we have to do is look at how the owner sells, extract the things that can be replicated, hopefully a well-defined value proposition, you know, clear differentiators, a good process, most and then them, build. Most of them don't have any of those. I know, which <laughs> is why they need you as well as us. Right. Together, we can put it together for them. Right. We That's need, correct. They, they need to hear from someone that has that expertise that can yes. coach them. Someone like you that can bring them along in the sales and marketing and someone like me that can work with them uh, on an ongoing basis because not only do we do some sales and marketing, but we help them structure their business Yes. so that they can do it. So that Absolutely. they have the staffing to do it. Most small businesses, uh, the CEO tries to do everything. And only, yes. you know, only 20% of his, 20% of his time does 80% of his business. Mm -hmm. And if he's using hundred percent of it, he's wasting 80% of his time. Yes. On things people, that have to be pushed out to other pushed people. Pushed out to other people to run yes. his business rather than, uh, uh, you know, him doing it himself. And he, he, he gets to, he gets to various uh, uh, balancing points and his growth, 1 million, 3 million, 5 million, and he can't grow anymore or he shrinks because he can't get out of his own way. Yes, yes. And, and I will tell you, and I hope that this adds value to your, to, for your audience. You know, um, as you know, I started the, uh, this firm uh, 14 years ago with my late wife. We were senior partners and co-founders of the company. And, you know, I lost her to cancer. Yes, and so we had, yes, thank you. I, yes. Uh, and, you know, Alice was wonderful. You knew her. Um, so I not only had to recover personally, but I had to figure out how to recover the loss of a critical leader in the company. And I'm pleased to say that that happened. But the only reason it was possible, the absolute only reason is because I was very fortunate to have some key people on the team 
who were comfortable stepping up because Alice had done a good job teaching skills, giving knowledge, documenting processes. Like we had infrastructure, you know, uh, it is something that I think about every day. Guess what? If I'm not here to answer emails, if I'm not here to check the company Slack channel, if, if I'm not available, the company needs to be able to run without me. OK, and that's critical not only to the long term value, it's critical to the short term survivability of any company. And the only reason some of us are able to think that it's not critical is because, you know, bad things haven't happened to us recently and we forget how easily they can. So it's really critical from both sides, your perspective, coaching that CEO and building a, a sustainable enterprise and our side trying to build processes and infrastructure that can scale along with it. We're both trying to solve this problem. Absolutely. Uh, no one is indispensable. No, no. And, 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 and if businesses are relying on one person, I mean, I had one client that filled out a $300 an hour. Right. And he was spending 10 hours a week on bookkeeping. Right. That was $3,000 a week. Yes. He was spending in bookkeeping, you know, at a week times 50 is $150,000. Yes. And he could have gotten a bookkeeper for $20, $25 part-time. Right. Part-time. To solve that problem. And he could spend those ten, those $150,000 getting more business. Yes. Plus he had both the new business and the loss of business that he didn't have before. It's a compounding effect. Uh, and he created a business by transforming himself and doing some of this, he transformed right. himself where he's running it. He's now part-time. Yes. He's now part-time. Yes. He's got some quality of life and he's making more money. And it's actually his son's now running the business. Mm. So you will appreciate this. One of the things that's a cornerstone of what we're doing this year as we grow, because we've hit one of those critical points and I'm aware of it every day. We have a motto this year, which is get the boss out of it, okay? And we have an org chart that we adjust constantly because it's a living document. And the goal of the org chart, we've actually placed my, my name, not just in one spot, but in every spot where I'm regularly involved in any kind of process. And the goal of the team is to X me out of each spot over the course of this year. So it's literally that tangible. But if you give, if you empower your team to have that mindset, particularly gamifying it, making it something that's fun and engaging, okay, they will take up the challenge because they're loyal, they believe in you, they want to be a part of this, give them the room. And I actually caught myself earlier today. I happened to see something in the company Slack. I stuck my nose into the middle of it. It had no need for me to pay any attention. And I apologized and said, I'm out. I turned off my notifications and set it aside. That's a critical thing we all have to learn. And I mean, I'm learning it. That's a hard muscle to exercise, but yeah. it's absolutely essential. I mean, I had I have a, one client that uh, was a military sergeant and he, when he was busy for 12 years, when they were mm. busy, he went out in the field and did the work that the rest of the people were doing. Mm. And every three months, four months, he was busy. Every three, four months, he had no sales. Mm. Right. And, and just a and cycle. It was a vicious cycle up and down and for 12 years until I finally convinced him that he had to delegate. Yes. He had to get someone to do estimating for him. Yes. He had to get uh, two people to be field supervisors uh, in the field. Uh, I think he's got a third one now uh, and do the and a bookkeeper and do all of that. And uh, in the next two years, he quadrupled 400% increase in sales. Yes. And went from, uh, you know, and I think his profits were 600%, you know, because he compounded his, his own time. It was an That's amazing right. transition. And as you gave the example of earlier with the gentleman who bills at 300 an hour and was doing bookkeeping, it's not just the lost time of that hour. It's the lost revenue of clients whose work you didn't get to. And so now you're pushing that backlog larger. Okay. And it's the lost revenue of the new clients coming in. Like you're throwing the entire, you, you, you've done is you've created a gigantic 
bottleneck. You know, right. it's almost like, you know, these fat bergs that are showing up in the sewers and there's all the, it's like you put a fat berg in the middle of your business and you're wondering why nobody can get around it. And then what we tend to do is we blame the employees for not swimming around or climbing around the fat berg that we've stuck in the middle of the company. Right. You know, so it, yes, there is, I, you have nailed something so critical, which is if there's any function, and this is absolutely true in sales and marketing, anything else with growth, if there's any function in the company you think nobody else can do, then you need to do a serious look in the mirror because there's only two possibilities. Either you're wrong and somebody else can, and you'd better get about the process of finding training and building that team, or you are for some reason correct and your business can never scale and you should ask why you're going to continue to do this. Right. You know, so that that look in the mirror moment is a critical part of the picture. I, well, I cannot I, agree I, more. I had one failure that uh, loved doing as the, the SEO work himself. He was ah. working 80 to 100 hours. Oh, my God. And he wanted to add, add some to a sales team. Right. And I said, you can't afford to add someone to the sales team yet. You've got to bring someone right. to the SEO. You've got to trust someone to do the SEO work. He right. didn't. He brought a salesman in who was quite successful for him. Right. In seven, eight months, he increased the business substantially. Right. And a year later, he sold the business for $25,000 mm. because everything collapsed around him. He couldn't right. get it done. The old customers were leaving. The new customers left. Yep. Yep. And, you know, as business people, we can feel it. I know I feel it. Uh, you know, I'm very aware every week of how are we doing? What is our capacity to deliver? What is our capacity to generate more revenue? How do we balance that? It's a balancing act. But this really goes back to why these pieces need to connect. You know, it is much more effective and efficient to have a unified growth strategy and to be able to execute that growth strategy with your team then what I call, what a lot of CEOs have traditionally thought of as divide and conquer, and I call it divide and be conquered. You know, they sit around in a meeting room, they got their head of marketing, their head of sales, their head of IT, head of operations. You know, all these people who are responsible for stuff. They're all siloed and they go around and they ask everyone for an update. And somehow they think that, that the collective result of that is going to drive any particular direction. You know, and it doesn't, it's divide and be conquered. All you've done is left yourself with a whole bunch of people doing slivers of stuff that aren't interconnected and therefore aren't going to take you where you need to go. Absolutely. With that message, I think we're, we're, we've used up our time today. All right. We'll just and have to I continue think that's a on great another place to, uh, to stop. So I want to thank you very much for uh, being a guest on today's podcast. Uh, uh, if people wanted to reach you at Went Partners, how can they do that? They can uh, go to wentpartners.com. That's W-E-N-D-T partners.com or give a call to our offices in New York or Washington. Well, thank you very much for being here. I appreciate it. And uh, uh, we'll be in touch uh, personally on some things anyway. Absolutely, uh, sir. Always a pleasure, Alan. Thank my you. My pleasure. I'm Alan Hirsch of Alan Hirsch Advisors, uh, your host. To reach me, visit my website, www.ahaonlinelearning.com and register to get my book, 40 Minute Breakthroughs. You can listen to the podcast of all past shows wherever you get your podcast by subscribing to AHA Business Podcast. You may follow me on LinkedIn at Alan Hirsch. I'm Alan Hirsch, and this has been an AHA Business Podcast.